Life is too intense to be endured with logic alone. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 63, A Naked Tree, After Hours with Dr. Don W. King. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, Matt, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. You might not recognize today's quotation. It comes from The Longest Way Round by Lewis's wife. So far in Poetry Month, we've had a good look at Lewis as a poet, but today we're going to turn to the poetry of his wife, Joy Davidman. And that means we're once again enlisting the help of Dr. Don W. King. Dr. King has taught at Montreat College for 48 years, teaching courses in British literature, and is the recipient of the Distinguished Professor of the Decade Award. He was on the show earlier this season to talk about Jack's brother, Warney, and then just two weeks ago, when he introduced Lewis's poetry to us. Dr. Don W. King, welcome back once again to Pints with Jack. Uh, this is getting to be kind of a regular gig. I enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, you're breaking records. I think it's actually the first time we've ever had the same guest on twice in the same month. Uh, when we were doing Two We Have Faces, Andrew was the first time we had a guest on twice in the same season, but you're doing the same month. Uh, but uh, when it comes to talking about Joy Davidman's poetry, it seemed pretty crazy to ask anybody else. Well, I sure uh, enjoy the uh, and appreciate the invitation. I, I think a lot of Joy as a poet. <laughs> well, I'm trying to cut down on my caffeine intake a bit, so I'm sipping on some mint tea made from some mint from my wife's garden. Do you have anything? Just my third cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> oh, caught, caught you a little bit later today. Yeah. <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers to you. So today we're talking about Joy Davidman Gresham Lewis. And we've spoken about Joy on our podcast before, but for newcomers who know next to nothing about her, would you mind just giving us a quick rundown of the things that we should know? Um, sure. I think in some ways it's a little unfortunate that she was, uh, in the past at least, has been best known as the woman who married C.S. Lewis in the last decade of his life. Um, because she was, in many ways, a very gifted writer uh, in her own uh, her own account. She was a brilliant woman. She graduated from high school when she was 14. She earned her BA in English from Hunter College when she was 19. And she completed her MA in English from Columbia University at 20. So uh, a really bright uh, person. She grew up in New York City, in and around New York City. And uh, she had one brother. His name was Howard. I, there's, there's really a couple of passages that might be worth reading just to give you a sense of the kind of voice that comes through in her poetry. Would that be okay? Yeah, great stuff. I like to start uh, with this poem that she wrote. It appears in her only uh, published volume of poetry in her own lifetime. The title of the poem is Yet One More Spring, and it goes like this. What will come of me after the fern has feathered from my brain? and the rose tree out of my blood. What will come of me in the end under the rainy locust blossom shaking its honey out on springtime air, under the wind, under the stooping sky? What will come of me, and shall I lie voiceless forever in earth and unremembered, and be forever the cold green blood of flowers, and speak forever with the tongue of grass unsyllabled, and sound no louder than the slow falling downward of white water? and only speak the quickened sand grain stirring, only the whisper of a leaf unfolding, only the tongue of leaves forever and ever. Out of my heart the blood root, out of my tongue the rose, out of my bone the jointed corn, out of my fiber trees, out of my mouth a sunflower, and my fingers vines, and the rank dandelion shall laugh from my loins over million-seeded earth. But out of my heart, core of my heart, blood of my heart, the blood root coming to lift a petal in peril of snow, coming to dribble from a broken stem, bitterly the bright color of blood forever. But I would be more than a cold voice of flowers and more than water, more than the sprouting earth under the quiet passion of the spring. I would leave you the trouble of my heart to trouble you at evening. I would perplex you with lightning coming and going about my head outrageous signs and wonders. I would leave you the shape of my body filled with images, the shape of my mind filled with imaginations, the shape of myself. 
I would create myself in a little fume of words and leave my words after my death to kiss you forever and ever. So I like to begin talking about joy by reading this poem because it gives striking evidence, I think, of the central characteristic of her voice as a poet. Concentrated, confrontational, demanding, determined, earnest, focused, hard to ignore or forget, insisting to be heard, not suffering fools lightly, piercing, serious, uncompromising, and zealot-like. And so this insistent, arresting voice, it's always present in Joy's work, whether it's poetry or fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> you could have just summed that up with saying, she's a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> I could have, that's right. <laughs> um, so I think that's the thing that I wanted to emphasize, at least at the beginning here, the importance of this voice that you see. Uh, so a little bit more about her life. She um, begins publishing in a number of prestigious uh, journals in the mid-1930s. Uh, she won the uh, Loins Memorial Award for Poetry given by the National Institute of Arts and Letters in 1938. By the way, an earlier winner of this was Robert Frost, so I think that tells you something about the value of her poetry or the power of her poetry. Uh, she, about this time, declared herself a communist and threw herself into the cause as an editor for the semi-official magazine of the Communist Party of the United States of America. That magazine was called The New Masses. She spent six months in 1939 in Hollywood working to write screenplays as a part of MGA's uh, attempt to develop uh, young talent. She wasn't very successful, and she blamed um, the system more than she blamed herself, but that's sort of an interesting biographical thing to uh, get into. Uh, as, a, as a reviewer for um, The New Masses, she could be pretty... Uh, <laughs> well, cutting? Pretty, she could be pretty cutting. Uh, here's, here's just a little excerpt from a review that she wrote about a World War II movie entitled I Wanted Wings. She writes, this reviewer has always considered herself f fairly articulate, yet face to face with I Wanted Wings, she feels the poverty of her vocabulary. All the words that describe it adequately are unprintable. The film <laughs> makes no bo bones about its intentions. It's a recruiting poster in style, sentiment, and static quality. If you imagine yourself compared, compelled to stare at such a poster for two solid hours, you'll have some idea of the entertainment value of this juicy offering. Using the crudest of appeals, I Wanted Wings alternates uplifting pep talks with uplifted blondes. A more flaccid script would be hard to imagine. It's astonishing indeed how many women there are in the Air Corps, that is the Hollywood's version. They attend court martials. They stroll across the field cheerfully snapping pictures of bombers. They stow away in airplanes. And they never wear any underwear or much overwear, for that matter. The film is a limping affair. You find yourself looking closely at the screen to make sure the projector hasn't stopped. There are, of course, some extremely beautiful and intelligent airplanes that contrast favorably with the human performers. <laughs> if Miss Veronica Lake ever puts on a brassiere, her acting ability will disappear. <laughs> So what do you th really think, Joy? Tell us about that. Um, so she becomes, as I said, active um, as a supporter of the Communist Party of the United States of America. But um, she ends up marrying a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, Bill Gresham. They married in 1942. Both by that time were becoming uh, disillusioned with the Communist Party. Uh, she gave birth to two sons, uh, David in 1944 and Douglas in 1945. Uh, the marriage was not very successful. Of course, whenever a marriage breaks down, there's fault on both sides. So I'm not going to try to analyze why that marriage failed. But at least some of Joy's biographers place most of the blame on Bill because he was unfaithful to her sexually and he suffered from alcoholism. So in the late 40s, she starts um, thinking, rethinking her position in terms of philosophically, and she also starts reading C.S. Lewis. I think uh, 
your listeners, if they can ever get a copy of Joy's autobiographical essay entitled The Longest Way Round, they'll get the best, best insight into what was going on with Joy at that time and how she moves to um, Christianity and the influence of Lewis. Mm-hmm. She eventually, after her marriage to Bill uh, falls apart, she does come to England, a lifelong dream, in uh, August of 1952. She, by this time, had begun a correspondence friendship with Lewis. So she meets Lewis for the first time, September the 24th, 1952. They they meet in the Eastgate Hotel in Oxford. I know a lot of your um, listeners will have been there. Mm-hmm. Sort of imagine that meeting. Uh, it was a very successful meeting. By the way, she spent really the rest of the fall touring England of course, she spent time in Oxford, but she also went uh, north to Scotland. And later, um, it's sort of an interesting thing. Lewis invited her as the uh, 1952 was coming to a close. He invited Joy to spend Christmas with him and Warney at the Kilns. Uh, this would have been a pretty unusual thing, I think, for Lewis to invite anybody to come spend time with him at the Kilns, but especially a woman. She. Um, and, and that was a seminal, I think, time for both of them. Anyway, she returns to England in 53. Her marriage, again, as I said, was breaking up. She moves back to England in the fall of 53. She said that she thought that they could live there more cheaply. This time she had her two boys with her. And um, all kinds of interesting things start to happen in terms of their relationship. Uh, and for years, we didn't really have any solid evidence um, to be able to kind of figure out what's going on with Joy and Lewis. But once her love sonnets to Lewis, this is a sequence of 45 love sonnets, once they were discovered in 2010, we were able to, using something Lewis wouldn't have liked, the per- personal heresy, if you, uh, <laughs> if you look at those poems, it's hard not to see the incredible biographical insights that we get into at least Joy's view of their relationship as it developed. Then, as uh, most of your listeners will have known, uh, Lewis ends up marrying Joy in uh, night in April of April twenty third, nineteen fifty six, ostensibly to extend citizenship to her, because they did live separately. Uh, about six months later, she's discovered to have bone cancer. It spreads through her body pretty quickly. Every everyone thinks she's going to die. And it's not until December of 56 that Lewis finally acknowledges publicly his marriage to Joy. In 57, March of 57, um, everyone thinking that Joy is going to die, he marries Joy in a church-sanctioned wedding at her hospital bed. A priest prays over Joy for healing, and miraculously, she recovers for the better part of two and a half years. Both she and uh, Lewis, I think, would have said those two and a half years were probably the happiest of their lives. Certainly they were for for joy. But unfortunately, her cancer returns with a vengeance and she dies in July of 1960. Mm -hmm. Lewis later wrote a friend about this and he said, I never expected to have in my 60s the happiness that passed me by in my 20s. (laughs) So that's just a that's a real quick overview of joy's life. (laughs) Yeah, we've had Abigail Santa Maria on the show to talk through her biography. And Joy, she is just a fascinating character. I I'm never quite sure whether or not we would be friends. Part of me thinks we could be best friends, other parts of me thinks that no, we would get on each other's nerves so much. Uh but she's definitely a very colourful character with lots of twists and turns in her journey. Well, I've you know, I've thought the same thing about the people that I've written about, the biographies I've written, you know, would they really like me or would they despise me? And it's hard. It's hard to know. <laughs> well, let's let's uh, let's turn specifically to Joy's poetry. I mean, obviously, it was interwoven with her story, but she starts writing from an early age because she's kind of this kind of wunderkind, um, literary, literarily very able, um, and her stuff starts getting published. Uh, would you mind just telling us about the the collection that was published in her lifetime? Yeah, during her lifetime, she only published one volume of poetry, as I said earlier, a letter to a comrade in 1938. 
Um, and she published another 30 poems in various magazines and book collections. So during her lifetime, only roughly 70 poems were published, uh, again, from Letters to a Comrade, Letter to a Comrade, and then the selected poems I mentioned a moment ago. But um, in 2010, scores of her previously unknown poems were uncovered. And just to kind of put it in context, I had written a book on Lewis as a poet, and then I'd written a biography of Ruth Pitter, a poet that Lewis that had influenced Lewis. And I was thinking, well, maybe I'll write a biography of Joy Davidman, the other. As some, one of my friends put it, uh, Don writes about Lewis's girlfriend. <laughs> yes. So I thought maybe... I thought maybe I'd write a biography of uh, Joy, but then I found out that Abigail was working on that biography, and so I I changed my focus. I had been collecting letters that I thought I would use in a biography, so I published uh, Joy's letters in 2009, and I wanted to begin writing on Joy as a writer, sort of a critical review of her as a writer. And I had the sense that there there were more poems that we just hadn't discovered. So um, this is what happened. You may know the story, I don't know. In early of 2010, uh, Doug Gresham, Joy's youngest son, he was contacted by the woman who he had stayed with after both his mother and Lewis died, Jean Wakeman. And she asked him to come and clean out her house because she was ill, uh, really uh, dying. And she was moving into a caregiving facility. So Doug said when he walked into the house to clean it out, his first inclination was just to light a match and throw it in and turn around because it was, it was quite jumbled up. Fortunately, he didn't do that, and he began going through some of the material. And one of the first boxes he opened up, on top of it, was a handwritten manuscript, I think, of letters to Malcolm. So he wow. began to didn't know that yeah, bit. Yeah, I think he began to dig uh, deeply more into that box, and what he discovered was roughly uh, 200 poems, um, short stories, a novella, and so forth, written by his mother that no one knew existed. So we had this new cache of material that, um, at least as far as I was concerned, was quite helpful because um, I, I wanted to write about Joy as a poet. I think that's her real strength. Her fiction... Anya published in 1940, Weeping Bay in 1950. Uh, I think they're decent novels, but I think it's I think her voice comes through much more powerfully in her poetry. Hmm. And how were the poems which she published? How well were they received? Well, as I said, she won a major award for her Letters to a Comrade, mm -hmm. or excuse me, Letter to a Comrade. So very very well received. And as I said, she published a good deal of, of her poetry in these prestigious uh, journals like poetry and, and so forth. But it didn't lead to more published collections in her lifetime. No, I think that's because she shifted to uh, her support of the Communist Party in the United States of America. She was very politically active. Mm -hmm. And you think that hurt her career? I do. Mm. But, but she was writing poetry. She just wasn't attempting to publish it. Mm. That, that new cache of poetry that was discovered in 2010 shows that she had done that. She, uh, what was really helpful, by the way, in that new material is that she had created an index of her own poetry. Hmm. Uh, one index, she has titles of 230 poems and a subsequent index, another 65 poems. So that's over 300 poems uh, that most of those had not been published, but we knew existed. And then as we went through the material, we, we were able to discover the poems. Mm -hmm. And those included these love sonnets to Lewis that yeah. nobody ever knew about. <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, when I was, when I was going through those uh, sonnets for the first time, I was at the Wade Center at Wheaton College, and, and literally at the end of each sonnet, I just sort of said out loud something like, oh, wow, or <laughs> I can't believe this, or wow, this is just amazing. Because it... They were both, and they are, really, really good sonnets, but also reflect so much about at least Joy's sense of how her relationship with Lewis was going. Mm -hmm. I think I think those sonnets, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about them a little bit later on, I think they're almost like a journal. Yeah. Uh, most of us, if we keep a journal, of course, it's in prose, but Joy, being such a gifted poet, 
her journal is really these sonnets. One of our Patreon supporters, Mo, he, we had an Inklings night, so we all jumped on a video chat just to share poetry that we enjoyed. And he had recently been on a trip, and he kept a journal in poetic form. Oh, daddy! Wow, broke Boy. my brain. <laughs> <laughs> so Joy has this these twists and turns in her journey. Part of the Communist Party, she's involved in Dianetics for a bit, then Christianity. Her marriage is breaking down. Do all of these themes start appearing in her poetry? What would you say are the main motifs that we find? I think there really are um, not 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 much biographical, or at least uh, I think that things that you can connect biographically to do or that that does show up in the sonnets to Lewis. But I think the the, the main themes in her poetry. Uh, first, there's a there's a series of poems that concern um, her relationship with God her understanding of death and immortality, um, the kind of things that I suppose almost every poet writes about, you know, thinking about, you know, the human condition and so forth. Hmm. A second, uh, larger uh, portion is given over to politics, especially her rejection of capitalism, her support for the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, her hatred of fascism, and her, as we might expect and know, her support of communism. And there's quite a few of those poems. I, I find those poems to be less compelling. And that's probably just because of my own bias. Mm. I think public poetry is always not nearly as powerful as what I would call private poetry. Mm. But again, that's just my own, own take on things. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, the largest body of her verse is devoted to romantic love, uh, focusing not only upon the physical delights of love making and a fierce desire to possess the beloved, but also on the desolation of either broken romances or unrequited love. Joy's quite frank, um, not certainly not in a pornographic way, but she's quite sensual in um, the sonnets she writes to other men but before she met Lewis about love. There are at least three sequences of sonnets that she wrote. And the two early ones have to do with uh, men that she was clearly in a, involved with in a sexual relationship. And this wouldn't include her husband, Bill. Hmm. When I read those poems, I'm often reminded of the line, until we have faces, the loving and the consuming are the same. Yeah. <laughs> she, she seems quite ferocious. <laughs> she does. <laughs> now, we've mentioned sonnets quite a few times. Uh, what other poetic forms did she typically favor? I think uh, having grown up, in the modernist period, as we would think of, uh, at least literarily, she does engage in a good deal of, of free verse. Um, and she's got lots of uh, writers that um, she, she emulates in terms of being a writer of free verse. But she also enjoys some of those older forms like the ballad, the most popular of all the French verse forms, the rondeau, another French form. The Sestina, a very intricate, complicated form that I wouldn't even try to attempt. <laughs> uh, the Villanelle, another. So I think the reason she's so influenced by these French forms is that she did read and write French. And uh, early on, she translated a number of uh, poems from French into English. So very much uh, influenced by that tradition. One of my favorite stories about Jack and Joy is when they would play Scrabble. And any language was fair game. Right. And they used two sets of tiles, as I understand. <laughs> I keep trying to convince my wife to let me play by the same rules. She, she won't let me. She, <laughs> she, she tells me Latin words are out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you edited uh, A Naked Tree, which is a collection of Joy's poetry. So let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. First of all, okay. why is it called A Naked Tree? I took the title from one of the sonnets that uh, Joy wrote to Lewis, and uh, I could read it now or I could read it later, but I think you'd get a sense of, um, you know, maybe why I chose to do that. So you want me to read it now? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. It, it's almost in the middle of the sequence. I just found the metaphor, the, the use of the idea of a tree is incredibly powerful. So this is sonnet 29 in the sequence. She writes... There was a man who found a naked tree sleeping in winter woods and brought her home and tended her a month in charity until she woke 
and filled his quiet room with petals like a storm of silver light, bursting, blazing, blended all of pearl and moonshine. He, in wonder and delight, patted her magic boughs and said, Good girl. I think that's funny, by the way. <laughs> Back to the sonnet. Thereafter, still obedient to the summer, the tree worked at her trade until, behold, a summer miracle of red and gold, apples of the Hesperides upon her, sweeter than Eden in its vanished bowers. He said, no, no, I only wanted flowers. And so, so if we think of the metaphor, joy as the naked tree, and Lewis as the gardener, it's it's pretty clear that Again, make you know, falling into the personal heresy, it's pretty clear that um, Lewis's attention to joy, and of course she sought it, caused her like a tree to bloom mm. and, and to produce fruit. And when she offered that fruit, you'll just have to fill in the metaphor yourself. <laughs> uh, Lewis said, no, no, I just really wanted friendship. I didn't want to go any closer than get any closer than that. So it just seemed really appropriate to use that line, the naked tree. Hmm. Uh, the title of the sonnets and so, or of the of the volume itself, and, and a lot of those frustrated poems. I've got to admit, they're actually some of my favourites of hers. Oh yeah, because you, yeah. you you really sense her her frustration and annoyance that why isn't this thing going where I'm expecting it to go? <laughs> yeah, I think what's so cool about the sequence um, is, I think it was designed as a piece of rhetoric, as a way of trying to get Lewis to love her. But as you know, we don't know for certain if Lewis ever read the sonnets. Mm. When I was working on them, Doug Gresham and I had emails back and forth. And he said to me, do you think Lewis ever read the sonnets? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you think? And he said, well, if he read them, he would have read them after he married my mother. Mm. Because had he read them before he married my mother, he would have headed for the dark side of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, yeah, re really powerful, persuasive attempt to uh, win Lewis's heart. Hmm. And um, she was used to attracting men. She knew how to do it. She'd had a number of uh, sexual relationships with men. And it may have kind of, in a way, it might have irritated her a little bit that Lewis didn't kind of get it, or at least get it in the sense of, what she wanted him to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what was involved in putting together this critical edition? How much hunting did you have to do, or was it more of collating and working out versions again? Uh, more the latter. Um, although once once we had the poems, um, I I was able to get a publisher interested very quickly. Not bad. <laughs> and uh, so this, yeah, this would have been about 2011, 2012. Um, but when I contacted the two brothers, uh, both David and uh, Douglas, Douglas was, he, he said, it's fine with me, but you'll have to um, get my brother's permission as well to publish the sonnets. Now, I'd worked with both of them earlier when I published Joy's letters, so I didn't expect there to be a problem. But when I asked Doug, should I contact David as I had in the past, David had only contacted me through faxes. He didn't use email or anything else. Uh, Doug said, no, you'll have to work through David's lawyer. And as soon as I heard lawyer, I didn't feel very <laughs> optimistic. And, and sure enough, when I contacted the lawyer, this would have been, I guess, 2012, he said, he very tersely, but not, not in an ugly way, he just wrote me back and said, at, at this time, Mr. Gresham does not wish these poems to be published. So I waited about a year and uh, started working on a book uh, what, what later became yet one more spring it was a study of joy as a writer. So after a year, I wrote the lawyer back and said, could I quote from some of the sonnets that haven't been published yet? And he wrote me back and he said, do you have permission to do that? He didn't say how much I could quote and I didn't ask how much I could quote, <laughs> but I didn't, I did not take advantage of it. So that would have been 2013. Then 2014, I wrote the lawyer one more time and I said, uh, you know, sort of, pleaded one more time, could could I publish these sonnets? And he wrote me back and he said, on behalf of Mr. Gresham, I give you permission to publish the poem. So the, the poems finally came out in 2015. I think uh, subsequently I learned that David was probably suffering from some form of dementia. Mm -hmm. And so the, I'm not sure if he ever even saw the, po the sonnets. I, I really don't know, but that's kind of how that came to be. Yeah. 
So it was a, about a three-year process of finding the sonnets before we could print them. Did she have lots of different versions like Lewis, or was she a little bit more one and done? Initially, as I was going through all the sonnets, this, I didn't find the sequence together until the end of the process as I was going through the, the poems. So initially, I was just reading these sonnets individually. Uh, and some of them were given names in, early, in the early drafts. But when you compare the early drafts with the final sequence, there's very little, uh, very little change that's going on. Maybe a one word changed or something like that. Nothing significant. The titles of the earlier uh, versions are interesting, and I, I include them as a footnote in the um, in the published versions. Hmm. You also dedicated your book to David, Jerry, and Warren. And uh, I've had a guess, but would you mind telling us who these people are? I'm always interested in who people dedicate books to, particularly when they're not specific. <laughs> uh, nothing very um, poetic about this dedication. These are these are three men that have been friends of mine for a long time, and we've done primarily as golfing friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2014, we took a golfing trip to Scotland. So when I came back, it just sort of seemed appropriate that I would dedicate the book to them. <laughs> See, there you go. I'm glad I asked. I didn't know you play golf. <laughs> it's a great, for me, it's a great relief from spending my, all my time in my head. You know? so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what's the official quotation? A good way to ruin a nice walk. <laughs> yeah, that's right. As I was reading the book, I can see that you've divided it into a number of sections. What made you choose the sections that you did? I think primarily uh, I tried to present the poems chronologically. And so uh, the, the first collection is, are, are the poems that didn't appear in Letters to a Comrade, so they're the poems that were written before um, Letter to a Comrade. Then the next section are the poems written that, uh, that show up in Letter to a Comrade. And then the next section are the other poems um, and then the final section are the sonnets to Lewis. Uh, I, I found it really interesting that she really, um, she didn't really write many poems after, or as far as I can tell, she didn't write any poems after the sonnet to Lewis. Uh, this, now, some of these might be discovered, but I don't think so. I don't think there are any other poems after the sonnets. Mm -hmm. Which might suggest a, a timing uh, factor in their relationship changed. Mm -hmm. And so, exactly. and so what she was expressing poetically, she, know, she now had another outlet. Yeah, yeah. Does her poetry change much over time? I mean, obviously the subject matter, but would you say the, the, the quality of it or the development of it, does that change at all? Uh, gosh, I think it's, it, uh, you know, the early poems, yeah, you can kind of tell that she's a poet in training, but it, they're pretty high quality. And so I, I think even after that, the quality is very high all the way through. I don't think she writes a bad poem, except in the sense that some of them are just sort of throwaway comic pieces. <laughs> um, she's such a serious writer that I, I don't think she would um, treat her poetry in a kind of casual way. Mm, that's good. That was also my impression. I, when I look at the different poems, I can't really guess their era at all, other than the subject matter. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you did for Lewis in the last episode you were on, would you mind just giving us a little bit more of a flavor of Joy's poetry by picking a couple of your favorites and talking to us about them? Okay. I think I'll pick one of her, I would call this a, a political poem. So this poem is entitled uh, Quizzling at Midnight. Um, it's actually one of the, the last poems that she wrote uh, while she was an editor at the New Masses. And a quizzling, in case uh, some of your uh, reader, or excuse me, some of your viewers might not know the word, a quizzling was a term used in World War II by the Allies for anyone who collaborated with the enemy. I only know the term because it's mentioned in mere Christianity. Okay, so here's the here's the point: quizzling at twilight. Houses are quiet at evening. The sad colors are sliding down the cypresses. Quiet, quiet. Eyes look out of the sky and the roof hides you, but the house is quiet. So many empty chairs, so many handsome rooms and no one in them but the company of lights. Turn on all the lights. Sit in the armchair. Not the one facing the mirror, but the one next to the friendly fire. But no one not there where the fire makes pictures out of memory. There next to the window. But no, not that glimmering pane shows your eyes here by the desk. But you see your face in the polish of the desk. 
so much fine furniture, but it costs too much at evening, with the sad colors and the voices you know it costs too much. The beetle ticks in the wall. The woman, beaten till the child in her womb, leaped once and was dead, is sobbing in the garden under the parrot perches. The broken fingers of the twelve-year-old boy scuttles across the floor. Or was it rats again? So many rats and someone here to feed them. But you meant no harm, did you? And there was nothing else you could do, was there? And they promised order, a new order, and you thought they would win. And there was a standard of living to maintain, and a blonde, and you were afraid. And somebody had to keep the mob in its place, and you were afraid. And after all, you were never the one who did the killing. The desk and the mirror and the window pane. Nowhere to go where you cannot see your face. The dead hands fumble for the latch. Oh. <laughs> That's kind of a frightening poem, isn't it? Yeah, really creepy. Yeah. Um, on a very different note, this poem, an early poem, it's entitled uh, Postscript, But All I Wanted. And it's it's a pretty powerful poem about sexual orgasm, I think. Okay. Here we go. Cover your children's ears. That's right. <laughs> But all I want is the sense of your mouth. But all I want is the look of your mouth and eyes. But all I want is the hair on the back of your head to run my finger over. Your body, the great and bare and splendid creation, come down upon me like the weight of God, descended upon me like the thunderbolt eating me wholly. But all I want is your presence, your possession, the shaft of fire, the great agony, the great beauty, the lifting up and using of my body to give you pleasure. I would embrace you with my hands and fingers, clasp across the strong bones of your spine, and feel the joints of your body with my fingers, and I would. And I would love you, beloved, who leave me here breathless, lying without knowledge of the muscles of your body. But all I want is the sun. But I want earthquake. But all I want, all I want, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, listeners, you can get a feel for, for, the, for the passion that this woman had. Yeah. Maybe one of, here's one of her religious poems, um, Again Rising, it's entitled. It, uh, this one does appear in Letter to a Comrade. In this poem, Joy gives us uh, kind of her, her notion of Jesus on the cross. Mm. Uh, Jesus, by the way, even before Joy becomes a Christian, even as a, a, a even before a conversion to Christianity, Jesus is a fairly prominent figure in her poetry. It's kind of an interesting thing uh, to look at. But again, this poem is given, I think, from Jesus's perspective on the cross. The stroke of six, my soul betrayed. As the clock ticks, I am unmade. The clock struck nine, my life ran down on gears of time with a sickened sound. The noonday struck a note of pride, spread on the clock I was crucified. The clock struck one, whose spear, whose dart transfixed my bone and narrow heart. The sound of seven filled me with bells, I left great heaven for little hells. The midnight let my blood run out, fierce and red from my opened mouth. Great chaos came to murder me when the clock named the hour of three. The dawn grew wide, the clock struck five, and all inside I was alive. It's so good. And a pre-conversion <laughs> joy as well. A absolutely. Um, and then maybe one more of the sonnets. You should probably at some time maybe have on your program a particularly a female reader, to go through, maybe just have a program on the sonnets. I, I once did a presentation at Bernal University in which I would talk about the sonnets, and then a, a woman from the theater department would, would recite the sonnet. That was really a lot of fun going back and forth. But I, I think uh, a woman's voice reading these sonnets uh, would be quite effective. Excellent. Listeners, shoot me a message. Let me know who you'd like me to have on to read them. <laughs> This is sort of a it's sort of a comic sonnet uh, from the sequence, the love sonnet sequence. Uh, it's it's, but it's also incredibly uh, poignant, I think. So she writes, uh, "This is sonnet thirty-eight. Yes, I know the angels disapprove the way I look at you. 
Creation weeps, observing how my naughty finger creeps along your sleeve. On this unlucky love of mine, even Mary Satan will not smile, nor waste a gilded flame on such a thing as you have left blackened and shriveling. The husk of me is hardly worth his while. But one day, riding on the upper deck of a large, red, respectable Oxford bus, you in the seat in front and I behind, coveting the back of your nice neck where your hair curls, why, I might lean and kiss. Somehow I do not think that God would mind. Can you believe that someone lusted after C.S. Lewis? <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't his fashion sense. <laughs> and you mustn't mind the smell of tobacco. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's lots of other poems we could look at, but I think that gives you a good good sense. Mm, I, think, I think it does. Thank you for that. And... Yep. As we did with Lewis, what is your final pitch? Why should people go read Joy Davidman's poetry? Primarily because she's an excellent poet. Um, of course, the people who are interested in Lewis and, and Joy, they would, they would want to read the poems, all of the poems for that reason. But primarily, um, I, think, I, I think these new poems that were discovered begs for a reconsideration of Joy's place as an American, a 20th century American poet. I think they elevate her to a quite high level. And I'll give listeners some homework. Read Snow in Madrid. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I didn't read that one because everybody seems to know it. I so. know. It was in the movie. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> you should read it, though, but you should read it. Yeah. Well, everybody should. Yeah. Dr. Don W. King, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you. Well, I'd love to have you on again at some point in the future to talk about Joy's letters, because if you think her poetry is wild, her letters definitely keep up to that standard. Yep. Uh, but as the barkeep rings the bell for final drinks, can you please tell listeners where they can go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of A Naked Tree, Love Sonnets to C.S. Lewis and other poems? All of my poems are available on Amazon, so you can find them there. Okay. I will put links to everything in the show notes. Thanks again to Dr. King for coming on the show. And thank you all for spending this hour with us. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, our top tier supporters, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Angela, Deborah One, Deborah Two, Amanda, Thomas, Anonymous, Bill and Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian and Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary and Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. Once again, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend and pick up a copy of the book and type out a poem on Facebook. I suggest Snow in Madrid. We'll be continuing our poetry exploration for the rest of the month, and then in September, we're going to be wrapping up this season. Please join us next time, when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>